my name is uh, Dr. Ravinder Singh Rao. I'm an intervention cardiologist and uh, uh, director TAVR program at EHCC Jaipur. I would like to apologize that I was not able to present my topic in the previous uh, uh, se seminar. So what I have done is I've collected both the topics today. However, I made sure that the uh, duration does not lengthen and I don't bore you with the uh, a lot of information. So what I've done is I've selected uh, something which is very important for our, for our practice and it will help us to take care of these patients in a better way. So uh, the topic is etiology, pathogenesis, uh, and imaging and CT scan assessment for severe aortic stenosis, uh, because this is one of the most important uh, valvular heart disease in which the treatment uh, has undergone dramatic change uh, from open heart surgery to transcatheter aortic valve replacement, where there is uh, no surgery which is required. And uh, I would like to thank all the uh, audience and uh, uh, who have joined in for the webinar. I can understand it is very, very difficult to attend a webinar in the era of uh, uh, COVID pandemic uh, where uh, webinar has become an epidemic. So thank you very much for joining. So this is uh, how we are classifying all valvular heart disease. This is a new way to classify valvular heart disease. There is a stage A, stage B, stage C, and stage D. Stage A is uh, at risk, uh, patients who are at risk for valvular heart disease, though they don't have a valvular heart disease, but they are at risk for valvular heart disease. Somebody who has a history of a fever in childhood or somebody who has had an exposure to uh, radiation to the chest wall, smoker, male, diabetic, there is the factor. So at risk patients, patients the risk factor for development of valvular heart disease. Stage B is progressive, so means Patients where the valvular heart disease has progressed from mild to moderate in severity, but these patients are asymptomatic. Stage C is severe valvular heart disease, but asymptomatic. Patient does not have any symptoms, though he has severe aortic stenosis, severe mitral stenosis, severe mitral regurgitation, but no symptoms. So asymptomatic patients who have reached the criteria for severe valvular heart disease among them, C1 is asymptomatic patients with severe VHT in whom left and right ventricles remain compensated. That is very important. C2 is, though patient is asymptomatic, but there is a decompensation which has started in the left and right ventricle owing to the pressure or volume overload depending on the alveolar disease from which patient is suffering. And stage D is symptomatic severe, which we all know. Patient has severe disease and now has developed symptoms. So if in our prescription, if we write stage C, stage D, then we know that C is asymptomatic and D is symptomatic patient uh, in valvular heart disease. So what is the etiology of aortic stenosis? If you see, there are three major, uh, three main uh, reasons for aortic stenosis. Number one is rheumatic aortic stenosis. Very common patient is young, has a previous history of rheumatic heart disease uh, in the past, and now presents with severe aortic stenosis. So Isolated aortic valve involvement in traumatic heart disease is very rare. It is less than 5%. Majority of time, there is both mitral and aortic valve involvement. So if a patient has aortic stenosis and patient also has concomitant mitral valve disease and patient is young, most likely this patient has rheumatic heart disease as its etiology for aortic stenosis. But if you see the uh, three main reasons are rheumatic, calcific, and then congenital. So what happens in congenital, remember the aortic valve is a tricuspid valve, and congenital becomes bicuspid or unicuspid aortic valve. So what happens in bicuspid aortic stenosis is because the opening is small, there is a lot of turbulence which happens, a lot of uh, uh, early degeneration. So a bicuspid aortic valve is present with severe symptoms as early as fourth decade of life. But sometimes a child can be born with severe stenosis and a and the third one is the calcific aortic stenosis, which is age-related degeneration of the aortic valve leaflet and deposition of the calcium. So how do you differentiate? So let us look at difference between rheumatic and calcific. You can also look at normal valve, how it behaves on the left side. So if you see in the rheumatic heart disease, there is fusion of the commissures. Can you see that? The commissures has fused, and that is how the opening becomes small. But on the other hand, the calcific the leaflets get calcified 
and because of that the mobility of the leaflet is restricted sometimes the calcium can be so progressive that both the leaflets can fuse and that is called a functional bicuspid which is seen in eighth or ninth decade of life but that's very important for us to understand uh, how do uh, the both the disease affect so this was the etiology of aortic stenosis what is the natural history of aortic stenosis so if a patient develops mild aortic stenosis how many of them will progress to develop severe aortic stenosis so if you see in this slide it's very important patients who are at risk those who have risk genotype risk valve morphology older age male sex dyslipidemia diabetes hypertension smoking ckd increased serum phosphates so shear stress inflammation lipid infiltration myofibroblast differentiation will cause mild aortic stenosis or aortic sclerosis so patients who develop aortic sclerosis 10 to 15% of them develop progressive disease and out of those all of them 100% of patients will go on to develop severe aortic stenosis over a period of 1 to 2 decades so that's very important if you see a patient with mild aortic stenosis in your clinical practice you need to keep following that patient because that patient will 100% develop severe aortic stenosis in future so what are the anatomical changes associated with severe aortic stenosis so if you see aortic valve is the most important valve in the heart and you see the leaflets become calcified and thickened and when the heart has to lv has to pump against this tight orifice and cause of that pump the lv becomes thickened that is called lv hypertrophy and the cavity becomes small now because the lv has to pump against stenotic valve the muscle become hypertrophy there is abnormal altered coronary blood flow and that is because of the demand mismatch the muscle thickness is too much but the blood supply is less and that is how the patient start developing angina what happens in the ascending aorta ascending aorta especially in bicuspid aortic valve the wall of the ascending aorta becomes weak and there's something called aortopathy which can develop in these patients and there can be an ascending aortic dilatation or ascending aortic aneurysm so pathophysiology of aortic stenosis normal left ventricle increase after load left ventricular hypertrophy so this is the compensation happens what happens in the decompensation phase there is cell death which will begin and when the cells start dying there is myocardial fibrosis which will set in and then the heart is not able to compensate for the stenosis and the heart starts failing and that is called heart failure and then that is when the lv becomes dilated so this is very important for us to understand because we need to intervene just before decompensation begins in an asymptomatic patient and in a symptomatic patient at the right time this is a very busy slide but as i said uh, a patient who is symptomatic needs to undergo a valve replacement and how do we sub, uh, follow up with asymptomatic patient is i'm going to discuss so what are the modalities for aortic stenosis this is how we would evaluate a patient with uh, aortic stenosis cardiac catheterization that is we go into the heart cross the aortic valve measure the pressure in the left ventricle measure the pressure in the aorta and then we get gradients that is called instant instantaneous great pressure measurements mean aortic gradient peak gradient peak to peak gradient and then we can also measure the cardiac output doppler what happens with doppler echocardiography on echo which is most common test which you would be seeing in your clinical practice we get an instantaneous velocity peak velocity and peak and mean gradients mri is uh, is coming up i'm not going to discuss about cardiac mri for uh, aortic stenosis but this is a picture which i would uh, which i would stress that even if in your clinical practice and if you have an echo report you should insist that an echocardiographer sends you this picture uh, along with the patient's report because by looking at the picture you can make sure whether this is uh, correctly done there is a severe gradient or low gradient so if you see these are the important chambers on parasol long axis you see left ventricle aorta aortic valve left atrium then you have again calcified aortic valve then you have left ventricle the aortic valve opens left atrium and then there's a turbulent flow in the ascending aorta if you see the velocity is 1.2 meters per second uh, in the normal patient but in aortic stenosis velocity 
if more than 4 meter per second that is called severe aortic stenosis so that's very important for us to understand how to measure echo parameters just a little detail for those of you who are doing echoes routinely or who want to learn echocardiography or who are interpreting echo images these are the parameters which you would assess lvot diameter how to measure it inner to inner edge mid systole parasternal long axis lvot velocity using a pulse wave doppler aortic stenosis jet velocity continuous wave doppler what are the windows apical suprasternal right parasternal then valve anatomy parasternal long and short axis and zoom mode so this is this is a very important differentiator which you should again suppose you are seeing a patient in your clinical practice you think this patient does not have aortic stenosis but some other valve some other uh, etiology for symptoms and you get an echo echo shows a velocity of 4 meters per second now if you look at the tracing look at the difference between first and second tracing the second tracing is called hocm it's a dagger shaped where there is a late peaking and that is how you would see in a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy which shows that the stenosis is not at the valvular lesion level but at the subvalvular level and it is a dynamic lvot obstruction so what is the role of low dose dobutamine echo in your practice so as you might come across a patient who has severe aortic stenosis which has been labeled but the mean gradient is only 30 or say 20 and the patient's ef is low so now you have to identify whether the valve is not opening due to low pumping efficiency of the lv or uh, severe aortic stenosis so you give dobutamine dobutamine increases the contractility so you start at 2.5 to 5 microgram per kg per minute increase the dose by 2.5 to 5 microgram per kg per minute every 3 to 5 minutes to a maximum dose of 20 micrograms per kg per minute so the infusion is stopped when you reach a maximum dose or a positive result is obtained and heart rate rises by 10 to 20 beats per minute over the baseline or exceeds 100 beats per minute symptoms blood pressure falls or significant arrhythmias this is time when you stop so what is the positive result if the effective orifice area increased by 1 cm square that indicates the stenosis is not severe Severe stenosis if velocity is more than 4 meter per second mean gradient more than 30 to 40 mm of mercury but the area remains less than 1 cm square what is absence of contractile reserve if failure to increase the stroke volume by 20% so if you see as we discussed these are the stages of a valvular heart disease stage 0 stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 this is the another classification if you have an lv damage la and mitral valve damage then there's a pulmonary and tricuspid valve damage and there is an rv damage so if a patient has an aortic stenosis first there will be lv damage but patient does not get treatment on time this patient will go ahead and have an la and lv damage mitral valve damage then patients will have pulmonary vasculature and tricuspid valve damage and finally will have an rv damage so if a patient had severe aortic stenosis and comes with rv failure poor very poor prognosis again this is uh, uh, the new uh, grading and staging classification which can also be used by clinics clinicians in their practice so if you see the stage 4 where there is an rv damage and patient is in grade 3 ar they have poor prognosis because now uh, and they need treatment at the earliest this is again the classification the outcome mortality outcome based on the staging what i want you to focus is just focus on stage 4 if a patient has severe aortic stenosis and develops rv failure the mortality is very poor it is as high as 24.5% so what is management of severe yes patient has symptoms yes no other comorbidities then the patient can undergo a transcatheter aortic valve replacement if patient is moderate to high risk uh, patient but if patient does not have symptoms ef is less than 50% patient should straight go for an aortic valve replacement or a tower patient is physically not physically active you can do a exercise stress test but a supervised supervised exercise stress test patient develops symptoms of blood pressure falls again an aortic valve replacement what about asymptomatic aortic stenosis there are a lot of patients which you would be seeing in your clinical practice that patient has aortic stenosis but patient says i don't have any symptoms but if the echo shows severe aortic stenosis we need to verify how so if you look at this tabular picture asymptomatic aortic stenosis but ef is less than 50% patient undergoes an aortic valve replacement 
this could be tower or surgical AFD valve replacement depending on the patient's anatomy. But if patient's EF is also normal, patient has severe aortic stenosis, does not have symptoms, you verify the symptoms. You ask the patient again and again. Sometimes what they do is they conceal the symptoms. So you do an exercise stress test. If exercise stress test is abnormal, patient undergoes an aortic valve replacement. But if exercise stress test is normal, then you look at jet velocity, rate of progression. You do a BNP, you do a pulmonary blood pressure. So again, if jet, pulmonary hypertension is present, BNP is elevated, again, patient uh, can undergo an aortic valve replacement, which is a class two indication. So this is very important. It was earlier in the past that uh, we used to wait for be beginning of the symptoms, but now if patient has severe aortic stenosis and patient is asymptomatic and patient can undergo a valve replacement either by surgery or by transcatheter, as low risk case, patient should undergo an aortic valve replacement. So how do we work together? This is the new level, uh, new um, idea for an optimal care. Uh, patient can be seen by a general cardiologist or a primary care physician. And if patient thinks that if the primary care physician diagnoses the patient with aortic stenosis, and now primary care physician has to evaluate whether patient has symptoms or not. If the primary care physician feels that patient does not have symptoms, then he can follow up the patient, uh, his own OPD and kind of uh, take care of the uh, other comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, and CAD because per se, there is no treat medical management for aortic stenosis. Now, if when the primary care uh, doctor feels that this patient's valvular heart disease is progressing rapidly or this patient is developing symptoms, then this patient can be referred uh, to us or any valve center where we can take care of his therapy either by a catheter without any surgery or by a surgical aortic valve replacement depending on what is best for the patient. And then the patient goes back to the primary physician and the primary physician takes care of this patient. They follow up and multiple patients from all across India has been uh, has been doing uh, have been doing this uh, with uh, when they have got treatment from me they go back to their physician the physician follows them with uh, routine blood tests and 2d echo and then one three six months and once in a year we discuss on phone we discuss all the reports and then we also discuss how to take care of these patients i just uh, picked up some very important uh, practice changing uh, things that who needs infective endocarditis prophylaxis not everybody because this is was a uh, this was in the past, all patients with valvular heart disease were getting infected on respiratory. But now, if a patient has prosthetic cardiac valve or hemograft has been implanted, patient needs an infective endocarditis prophylaxis or prosthetic material used for cardiac valve repair, such as an endoplasty ring and cord. Patient previous history of infective endocarditis, unpaired cyanotic congenital heart disease or repaired congenital heart disease with residual shunt or a cardiac transplant patient with valvular regurgitation due to abnormal valve. This was very important to share with you because this affects our practice. Recommendation for bridging therapy for prosthetic valve. So continue anticoagulation with therapeutic INR is recommended patients with mechanical heart valve undergoing minor procedures such as dental extraction or cataract removal where bleeding is really confirmed. So you see, if your patient is a, has a mechanical valve and is supposed to undergo a dental extra extraction, you need not stop the anticoagulation. Or if patient has to undergo a cataract surgery, you need not stop the anticoagulation. Temporary interruption of vitamin K antagonist without bridging while the INR is subtherapeutic is recommended in patients with bileaflet mechanical AVR with no other risk factor for thrombosis. So this is very important. Now, if you have a patient who has a mechanical aortic valve place, now patient is supposed to undergo some surgery. Usually what we do is we give heparin, injection, injection low molecular with heparin for two or three days, and then the patient undergoes surgery. But you see, if your patient has only aortic valve replacement and a bileaflet mechanical AVR, you need not bridge this patient with low molecular weight heparin. And this is class one recommendation. But if patient has a mitral valve, then definitely you have to bridge with low molecular weight heparin. What, is, what are the indications for TAVR? Now it is class 1C for patients who are high risk for surgical AVR and class uh, 2A for patients who are intermediate risk for surgical AVR. 
Do statins work in aortic stenosis? No. Statin is not indicated for prevention of hemodynamic progression of AS in patients with mild to moderate aortic stenosis. How do you follow these patients in your clinical practice with echocardiogram? So if you see, if patient is in stage C, what is stage C? Means severe aortic stenosis. Severe aortic stenosis, but no symptoms. You follow them with echo with every year. Mild to moderate, mild aortic stenosis, echo every three to five years. Moderate aortic stenosis, echo every one to two years. What does that mean? That we need not get every echo every two months, three months. No. If a patient has mild AS, three to five years. Moderate AS, one to two years. Severe AS, every year. So now let us look at the CT scan analysis. So this is very important. How do we decide that what size of valve will be put inside a patient when we are evaluating a patient for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Remember, when a surgeon does an aortic valve replacement, he would cut open the chest, cut the aorta, remove the leaflets, and put the new valve inside the old valve. But we don't open the chest. We would go from the femoral artery, put the new valve inside the old valve. So how is the valve size? And the most important thing is the CT angiography. So I'm going to discuss a few important slides about CT angiography. On the echo, what happens is that the measurement is a two-dimensional measurement, and we do not get the full impression. So if you see the echo, you get one measurement, but endless is actually an oval-shaped, three-dimensional structure. So anything which is measured by echo is not useful. Multi-slice CT scan is the most important parameter investigating tool to assess the annulus size. So if you see this picture, this shows the residual leakage after doing tower is maximum if the valve was sized based on the echo and minimum if the valve is sized based by the perimeter on CT scan. So these are the things which we look on the CT scan. We look at the annulus, sinotubular junction, ascending aorta, left ventricle, left atrium, and the membrane septum. So another important question or thing which comes in the uh, physician's mind is what will happen to the coronaries? So if you see in this picture, the coronaries are on one side of the valve frame and they easily fill during the diastolic phase. They don't get uh, occluded by the tower leaflets. So this is again a CT scan picture in which we are able to classify whether a pain is bicuspid or tricuspid, has a fused RFA or not, and what is the amount of calcium. And this is important because uh, one question which came to me from a physician is, uh, if you do tower in a calcified leaflet, the calcium might go somewhere. So if you see, the tower is actually approved for calcific aortic stenosis. And uh, what we do is we take care of the calcium and we evaluate the patient post-procedure if there is any stroke which happens. This is a picture which shows a different morphology of aortic stenosis, aortic annulus. And aortic annulus is a dynamic structure which changes during diastole and systolic phase uh, of uh, cardiac cycle. These are the various measurements which can be obtained on CT scan, perimeter, area, short axis, long axis, and the diameter. And if you see, this is how the aortic root is related. There is RVOT, there is left atrial appendage, left atrium, and the right atrium. Then we also measure the distance, distance of the coronary artery from the annular plane. Any coronary artery which is bigger than, higher than 12 millimeter it is safe, the coronary occlusion will be very less. Then the, another question is, does this valve interfere with the conduction system? So if you see the membrane septum, uh, uh, length of membrane septum will, uh, it will tell us whether this patient will develop a complete heart block or not. The reason is the conduction fibers go five, six millimeter below the annular plane. But if the membrane septum is very small, they can be even closer. And the conduction, the valve frame can interfere with the conduction system and can cause a complete heart block. You look at the calcium which is there in the LV outflow tract and calcium is required for anchoring of the valve to the annulus uh, in a calcified aortic stenosis. Sinus of Valsalva. So if you remember, there are three sinuses, left, right, non. Left sinus is the place from where the left coronary artery arises. Right sinus is the place from where right coronary artery arises. So if the sinus of Valsalva are wide, it is very low chances that this patient will develop uh, a coronary occlusion uh, during tower. So this is how we measure the coronary height 
But if the coronary height is below above 12 millimeter, the chances of coronary occlusion during a trans catheter valve placement is very low. So this is very important slide because if you see 99% uh, of my cases are transfemoral, I would do a AOD valve placement from the femoral artery. And if you look at the data from the partner two subset study, it was a transfemoral tower which was superior than open heart surgery uh, with p value of uh, p value of 0.04. So we need to assess what is the size of the uh, pelvic vessels, whether these vessels will be able to take up the sheath or the tube from which the valve will be delivered. Then we also look at the level of bifurcation, the amount of calcium uh, in the pelvic vessels. And this is a 3D picture where we can assess the size of the pelvic vessels again. So let us just look at the example. A 78-year-old female, severe aortic stenosis, mean gradient of 90, peak gradient of 140, NYHA class 4, underwent a CT scan for tower, urosepsis, positive blood culture. So a patient with aortic stenosis develops symptoms and develops cardiogenic shock, uh, medical therapy does not work. So this patient was turned on for surgery. Then I did a balloon aortic valvuloplasty. You would see how the aortic valve is opened with the balloon. And once that is done, the patient is off inotropes. And then I'm going to show you how it is replaced from the femoral artery. It would go across the femoral valve. And this is a cell example of a self-expanding valve, which, uh, which has been deployed in the aortic root position and this valve starts functioning immediately. And then similar type of examples. Here is an example of a balloon expandable valve, which you would be putting in the annular position. The valve is inflated, deployed, and you see there is no endotracheal tube in this patient, and the valve starts functioning immediately. There is no leakage and no coronary occlusion. Patients stay in hospital for next uh, three to five days, and then they go home. And this is an example of a tower with a uh, mitral process where uh, mitral balloon alveoplasty was done. But this is important. You see how the coronary arteries have been protected with a stent and a valve is being deployed. And then patients do extremely well. They stay. There's a very uh, uh, small hospital stay and very fast recovery. So uh, the important message in this presentation is number one, to understand the geology of uh, aortic stenosis, and there were three types. There was uh, dramatic heart disease, congenital, and calcified sclerosis. Number two was to understand the pathophysiology, how there is compensatory phase, then there is a decompensatory phase, and uh, how uh, the, uh, at what point of stage we need to replace the valve in these patients. Third one was, what is the new changes in the guideline? New changes is how to classify aortic stenosis stage A, B, C, and D. And then there's few changes in the management, like infective endocarditis prophylaxis, vitamin K uh, antagonist interruption in a mechanical valve patient. And the latest is transcatheter aortic valve management uh, without open heart surgery. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, what we would do in the next, next uh, lecture, I think it's going to be focusing on the therapies of aortic stenosis, where I would show you how a valve replacement being done without open heart surgery is better and how these patients behave uh, in a properly selected case and how fast is the recovery. And we'll also discuss about uh, newer modalities of treating aortic stenosis. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So uh, if there is any question, you post uh, on the link or you can also email us. And uh, uh, we would also plan a certification course at the end about on valvular heart disease and focused on aortic stenosis. And um, so th there is a question, I think there is a question, transcarotid subclavian, transcaval axis in patient with AS, stenosis of femur. So that's a very important question. What are the other alternative approaches for a patient uh, who has severe aortic stenosis, but patient also develops, uh, uh, has uh, calcification or stenosis of femoral artery? So the al other alternative approach is subclavian artery, carotid artery, or a transcaval. There is, we go from IVC to the aorta, and from aorta, we go ahead and deploy the valve. But if you look at the entire literature, it is the transfemoral TAVI, which is superior 
then open heart surgeries. So what I do if my patient has some stenosis in the pelvic vessels, I would do a balloon angioplasty or treat the stenosis in the pelvic vessels and then try do the TAVI from the femoral vessels. So it serves two purposes. Number one, uh, it uh, uh, treats aortic stenosis and definitely it treats the peripheral artery disease and patients uh, do not have intermittent claudication in these cases. Um, so I think if there are no further questions, thank you very much.